Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and or good evening, wherever you are. A warm welcome to all of you who have joined us today for this virtual academic program on national security research development and implementation in Africa. My name is Luca Byung Deng Kwong. I am the academic dean at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies and the faculty lead of this program. Uh, I will be moderating as well uh, this session. Uh, let me now just introduce, just to reflect you a bit about our program objectives. As I mentioned in session one, this round two is of is divided into the following three sessions. Session one, focus on phase one and phase two of the national security research development process. That is focusing on the planning, initiation, and peer drafting in terms of assessment, review, and analysis. Session two, um, focus on phase three and four of the national security side development process, and that is focusing on drafting, review, and consultation. And this session, session three, uh, the last session of round two, uh, will focus on phase five and, five and phase six on the adoption, approval, dissemination, and communication. But before I proceed with our conversation, um, and let me share with you the key takeaways from the last session, session two. Uh, that's on the drafting and review and phase four on the consultation. And this, this session was basically based, informed by the case studies of South Sudan and Niger, as well as our toolkit. But here are some of the key questions that came out from the, uh, from the plenary discussion or even discussion group. So the real question is what to be drafted. Based on the audit of security sector and security environment assessment analysis and analysis, as we discussed in phase two, the drafting team may agree to key steps for drafting the format and the key elements of the document. Some of these elements are provided in the toolkit box form, including a commonly agreed definition of security, shared national values and vision for security, national security interests, security threats and opportunities, a national security objective, division of labor and restructuring of security sector and implementation mechanism. So before you could start anything, you should be able to agree on these elements and the key steps as provided in the toolkit and also uh, highlighted by the, the two case studies. Then the second question is how to draft. Uh, based on the key drafting steps and elements of the, of the document, the drafting team may organize itself into a specialized technical subcommittees to craft a specific set of the elements of the document. This will provide the basis for crafting the first national uh, security draft that present the initial articulation of the key elements of the document. And this will provide the basis for consultation. The feedback from technical and national wide consultation will be reconciled and incorporated into one coherent document known as the reconciled document. But then the question, what to consult on? Based on the first draft, the drafting committee may develop a plan of action for consultation on each drafting step and element of the document. There are some steps and elements that may require technical consultation and there are elements that may need both technical and nationwide consultation. Given the logistical and resource constraint, the drafting team may identify the key elements and specific issues of the first draft to be subjected to public consultation, particular issues that require national consensus, uh, such as understanding of security, security vision, security interest, security threats and objectives. Then the question, how to consult? In a fully functioning, a representative democracy. The design of any public policy is scrutinized by the elected representatives of the people in the parliament, rather than subjecting it 
to a nationwide consultation. Given the status of democracy in Africa and the weak link between members of the parliament and their constituencies, the nationwide consultation on strategic issues such as national security is essential and it can complement the scrutiny by the parliament. But here the role of leadership becomes important in, in sanctioning the nationwide consultation. Given the crisis in representative democracy, not only in Africa, but globally as reflected in low voter turnout, decline in membership of political parties, increase in distrust in, in politicians and shrinking interest in politics. Consulting people directly on the design of, pub, of public policy uh, becomes a necessity. The toolkit that we have provided uh, provides a multiple option for public consultation, especially figure six, and for special approaches such as focus group discussion may be the best way to solicit input from citizens on core issues on the initial draft. Also, the drafting team may use appropriate representative sampling methods for soliciting inputs from the citizen uh, on the first draft. And and, and even equally the reconciled draft. The consultation during the process can be conducted at three levels, namely strategic level, tactical level, and operational level. And with several formats, such as formal uh, consultation, informal consultation, or, or public consultation. But then the question is, who to be consulted? Based on a commonly agreed national definition and understanding of security and security sector, there's a wide range of stakeholders to be consulted, including individuals, groups, and institutions that are responsible for the provision, management, and oversight of security for people and the state, particularly, particularly community and traditional authorities, civil society actors like women and youth, researchers, all political parties, including the opposition parties, academia, and media professionals. And the toolkit provides a range of stakeholders to be consulted during the process. Then the other question is how to build consensus and compromise. And given the complex nature of nature and sensitivity of security, and coupled with a security sector with a history of abuses and violation of basic rights of citizens, the nationwide consultation on the first draft are likely to generate violent and sometimes incompatible views. This will make it difficult to reach a consensus and compromise on what to be incorporated in the reconciled draft. One option is to establish an independent and credible committee of experts as a sounding board and a conflict resolution mechanism during the process, as in the case of Burkina Faso, as we'll hear today. The other option is to subject uh, some of these violent views to further or more targeted consultation with different stakeholders. And that will be time consuming with need, with need for more resources. Um, uh, and in addition, the drafting team may subject the reconciled draft to further review and consultation with these key stakeholders and some selected national experts. Building consensus does not mean full agreement and accommodating all the views, but rather reaching a compromise through a trusted and credible mechanism and process. These are some of the key takeaways. So what do we want to achieve from, the, uh, from this session, the last session of round two, section three? We want to achieve the following. Examine the process of approval and adoption of the national security strategy document and the engagement of national parliament. Number two, to discuss how the national security document has been disseminated and communicated to different stakeholders, particularly women, civil society, youth, and their feedback as well, how their feedbacks have been uh, entertained. And the last point is to share the main features and key elements of national security strategy development, uh, national security strategy document, and whether the document is publicly accessible, the issue of confidentiality. So, so as I mentioned, I mean, just to, to echo again, this preliminary conversation session will be for about four to five minutes, and then followed by a question and answer. 
And we hope by the end of this program to, to provide you with the necessary concept, framework, tools, and skill for developing and implementing national security strategies in your countries. And let me now move to introduce the panelists. I'm pleased to welcome, and I said earlier, this round, round two, is about practical practitioners actually sharing their personal experience. So I'm pleased really to welcome three outstanding and seasoned experts and practitioners for national security strategy development. And they will help us to start the conversation about practical process of national security strategy development. So you have your own bi their, their bios. I will highlight only some relevant aspects of their expertise and qualification. For this session, we are taking two case studies. The case of Nigeria, and that reviewed its national security strategy of 2014. And then the case of Burkina Faso that have recently concluded their national security strategy policy. So we are talking of a real practical example of case studies. So we're really honored that these, these panelists will be, will, be, will be having Ambassador Clement Lesinde. Uh, Ambassador Lesinde was the chairperson of the review of the national security strategy development, uh, national security strategy, the strategy of, of Nigeria. And we are lucky that he is now with us to share uh, the way they review their national security strategy. So he, overs he oversaw the, uh, the process of the review of national security strategy of, of Nigeria. He was the member of the Nigerian uh, Review Committee. He served in many diplomatic missions of Nigeria over a period of 34 years until he retired in 2010. He served as a director of policy and strategy in the Office of National Security Advisor. He was a co-chairperson of Interagency Consultation Committee on Election Security. And he was appointed as a member of the Presidential Committee on his small arms and light weapon. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Lesendi, to join us today. The second uh, panelist is, is Colonel Major Tidor Pale. He is the National Security Advisor of Burkina Faso. And he, he, he oversaw and is still overseeing and coordinate the national security side development process in Burkina Faso. He also served as, uh, as a secretary to the Higher Council of National Defense. And he's the Secretary General for the National Defense and Executive Secretary of the National Committee for the Crisis Management of the COVID-19 pandemic in Burkina Faso. Uh, earlier, he served as a Chief of Staff of the Air Force and Deputy Chief of General Staff of the Armed Forces of, of Burkina Faso. He's a career and professional armed um, Air Force officer. Um, uh, Colonel Major Pale, you are most welcome for joining us. And the last but not the least is Fele Shapius. And I think I shared with you her bio, but let me just highlight for, the, for those, just for the information and sharing the, uh, her background. She is an independent expert on conflict and security. And she's the one who actually review our national security strategy development toolkit. And she's a rostered expert for the international security sector advisory team. Uh, and she worked with, uh, with the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance, usually known as DECAV, is a world leading center in security governance. So fairly, you are most welcome and, and for joining us. Let me start my con our conversation uh, with, with Ambassador Lesende. Uh, Ambassador, you, you, you oversaw the, uh, the review of the Nigerian National Security Strategy of 2014. And can you briefly, in just within five minutes to six minutes, share with the participant what resulted, what led, what are the reasons for the review of the National Security Strategy? And the, can you briefly describe the process of review and consultation? And in particular, the role of the National Security Strategy and National Security Advisor during the review process. Ambassador, you are most welcome. Just within 
five to six minutes, please. Thank you, Dr. Luca. Thank you, uh, other panelists and uh, participants. Um, in the two, the first document, the first NSS document was in 2014. In that document, it was indicated that usually in a national security strategy document will be due for review at periodic intervals. It varies from country to country, either five years or 10 years, but it's for the government at that time to decide whether enough things are taking place to necessitate a review. So in 2019, the national security advisor decided that a lot of things had happened in Nigeria and that, that 2014 document would need a review. And some of the changes, one, and the most important, Boko Haram terrorism in the northeast part of Nigeria. In 2014, it was the main thing and it was threatening life and uh, 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 everything in the northeast, especially three northeast states. By 2019, the military had been able to contain, you know, uh, uh, and, and make sure that uh, Boko Haram, they were no longer holding any territory. That's number one. Number two, by 2019, other issues came to the extent that they made Boko Haram insurgency uh, not to be that important again. One is artsmen and the farmers problem. Now, under normal condition, you say, how can artsmen and farmers compare to Boko Haram? Well, the artsmen and farmers problem was all over the country and it was killing and maybe more people. So government took it seriously. Third is that you have banditry. That's something to do with us men. I explained it uh, earlier. That's number three. Number four, you had a situation where there were many things. The, the Al-Qaeda and ISIS were getting bolder and bolder and coming to West Africa. And their target mainly is Nigeria because of the large population of uh, people of the same faith, I think that was their problem. And they, they, they said it in many documents. So when all these things are put together, it, it was decided that uh, there's need for review so that the country, the government on one side and the people can reevaluate the problems, the security challenges that they were having. The second thing is the process of review. The, 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 this process of review is similar to the 2014. Letters were written by the NSA to, to about 50 to 70 agencies. These are the key in Nigeria. The, the security agencies are divided into military, paramilitary, uh, MDAs, that is the Ministry like Foreign Affairs and Co. All these people were written to say that when, uh, the NSA's office was going to conduct a review uh, this is your area of governance or what you do. Can you tell us what steps you have taken or what are your experiences? And many of them wrote back to suggest things, you know, uh, and the, that, so we have a lot of documents written. Then uh, many of them came also for verbal briefing to find that, and at the end of the review, all these agencies were called to come and listen to, to, to what has been put down and say whether they agreed or not. Then the consultation that I told you was uh, with all these agencies, because when the letter was written, they were told that where you are not sure of what is intended, you need to ask, you need to come so that we can review, we can discuss. And the first point of discussion will be the 2014 document. Because if you don't understand what is in 2014, you cannot be talking of review, you know. So, so, so the, the, that is the, the, the consultation with that. And then what is the role of the National Security Advisor? In Nigeria, there are many security agencies. The National Security Advisor is, a, is an advisor to the president. It's a civilian role. Whether the person has had military background or not, it doesn't matter. There are people who are not in the military who became national security advisor. So the national security advisor is a coordinator of all the security agencies, 
of all the security issues of anything security in Nigeria. He is the one that advises president, he is the one that writes memo to point out what is going on. So at, at a time, the National Security Advisor decided that uh, we informed the president that there was a need to review, which he did, and the president approved the review. So the, the role, the, the, the NSA is very critical in anything security in Nigeria. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, uh, for such explanation. And the, uh, maybe the, the second question is about, if you can just briefly also describe to us the process of approval and adoption of the, uh, the review document. And, uh, and 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 some of the uh, the the communication whether you develop any communication and the dissemination plan for the uh, for the, the document and important whether the document um, is public or not is it classified or public uh, I would appreciate your just a brief intervention on these issues thanks so let me start with the last question the document is public it's not I think it's on the internet because that was the the review committee's proposal and, and the office of the NSA accepted, whether it's there now or not, but the document is all over. In fact, at any interaction is given out to as many people as possible, including foreigners. The EU uh, delegation in Nigeria was invited, the American, the, uh, many embassies and the foreign affairs. So it's a public document. Now the process of approval is that since the NSA works for the presidency or for the president. Uh, the NSA sent a letter to the president that this is what I intend to do. And the president approved. Then uh, the president also approved the composition of the, of the review committee. You know, because the review committee is very important because it has to be balanced. It's not only security agencies, you had the uh, human rights groups, you had women's groups, you have all sorts of things to include as many people as possible. And one of the things that, I, uh, that has happened is that the, 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 the review had focused on saying that Nigeria had moved from regime security to human security. That is the security of individuals within the country in terms of their property and in terms of their physical person. So, so once the president approved, it went on. And when the document was ready, the president was sent a final copy. And the president was the one that signed the forward of the review. And that forward contains a lot of things to say that this is what Nigeria is trying to achieve. This is our problem. This is the solution we are thinking. And this is the way we need to go. And of course, the preface just talk about the, 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 the content of the document and other things like uh, the duration and things like that. So the, that is the, the, the process, that is the, then the communication and dissemination. One of the first thing to do is to have a stakeholders uh, forum. The stakeholders forum encompasses all the security agencies, universities. There are about four or five institutions of um, research. Uh, the National Defense College, which uh, senior military officers have to attend. Then there's the National Institute of Policy and Strategic Studies, which is for senior management, any, uh, uh, both in the private sector and government. Then there's the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, which deals with foreign policy and international relations. And then there's the Institute for Police and Conflict Resolution, and uh, a lot of other departments in the universities. They were all invited, plus traditional rulers, students. There is something called National Youth Service for those who have graduated who will do national service. They were invited with their leader. So that was done to even look at the document that is uh, available and to see how it could be improved. Because what the office of the NSA was looking for was a critique of that document before it becomes final document. And that was done. Then the next phase, which is uh, implementation, was to uh, go around each of the six geopolitical zones and have what we call town hall meetings. That is, all it will allow the state or the, the, the group of states in a geopolitical zone 
to invite anybody, those who are interested in security, but we will guide them. I mean, the office of the NSA will, will guide them to say that this, we want a broad uh, section of the society to attend. And then the thing will be explained to them so that uh, the input can be contained. So I think I've answered the, the, the is there anything that I missed? I think that is all. Thank you. Yeah. Uh yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent, uh, Ambassador. Maybe can you tell us the main chapters or the main elements of the document, how it looks like, what is, what is in it? Yes, okay. Um, the main uh, elements of the document, let me, let me make sure that, uh, okay. The, the, the original document was divided into sections uh, and now, but this one was divided into chapters. And the chapter, chap, chapters one of the NSS covered national values, national interest, national objectives, while chapter two gives an overview of Nigeria's geostrategic environment. Chapter three examines the current and future threat environment. Chapters four to seven provide appropriate strategies to ultimately ensure peace, prosperity, Okay, let, it, when I say peace prosperity, let me, peace is looking at it from security strategic view. Prosperity is looking at it from economic view, all the, all the economic challenges and how that had to be done. And then lastly, uh, the, the, the seventh chapter looked at uh, the international environment, ECOWAS, AU, uh, United Nations, uh, National uh, Commonwealth, and other agencies, uh, other for where Nigeria is involved. Then chapter eight is conclusion. And that is the main element in brief. Thank you very much, Ambassador. The Thank last you. question, can you share as briefly some of the challenges that you encountered during the review process? And how did you manage some of these challenges? Okay, uh, like I said earlier in another forum, I didn't see any challenge. Number one, the, the review committee was carefully selected for, for the committee members to be passed to the president for approval. That means, and, and that means you have to justify everybody there. Two, we had a good environment in the office of the NSA where we sat down. We, we, there was no nothing. Uh, but, but, so, but let me just look at it. My view, personal, this is my personal view is that some agencies had difficulty in understanding some of the things they were expected to do. Because we didn't put police do this, military do this, uh, civil society do this, this, that. So when they are written like that, some people are lost. They find it difficult to, uh, to fix themselves in. So we have to break it down. That when we talk of economic, let me just use an example of economic security. Economic security, the Ministry of Agri is important. The, the, the Ministry of Labor is important. So now what we told them is that you have to say what you are trying to do to make sure that Nigeria is more secure in that area. So th that may be the problem. Another problem I see, which was not the problem we encountered when we did the review, is that uh, officers are moved around regularly or, or, or from intervals. And therefore, you may have a situation where the person that you explain the review process to or the content of the document is not the one that is there in future. Another person comes there, he has not gone through the, the, the sensitization and therefore has a problem. That is the only problem that I see in the, that, but this is not a problem of the review, it's a futuristic problem. Oh, well, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Lesende. Uh, this is a great, uh, good, good elaboration of Nigeria, and I think people may will benefit and for the uh, and for the uh, for the uh, for the participant. Uh, Ambassador Lesende is the one who wrote the uh, the Nigerian case studies of the review of the national security uh, strategy of Nigeria, and he's one of the resources, the reading material available, and you could read a lot of things on that. Uh, let us now move to the the case of Burkina Faso. Uh, Colonel General uh, Major uh, Pale, um, as a national security advisor, 
you oversaw the process of the development of national security strategy of Burkina Faso. Uh, just in the same way, can you share with, with us the, the reason for the national security research development in Burkina Faso? And, and possibly, I, um, um, how did you manage to define the, uh, the issues of security in your context? And, uh, and, and, and to share some of the mechanism for the drafting, the subcommittee uh, committee that you established for the drafting, especially the uh, reference to the scientific committee, as you mentioned in the, uh, in the document. Um, um, General, you are most welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Luca. And thank you to all those who are listening. Burkina Faso began uh, thinking about the, the drafting after the popular insurrection of 2014. And there was a big in popular insurrection in 2014. And just after that, politicians um, thought about asking for a reform of the security sector to dissolve the president's power within the armed forces, but it didn't take place. And in October 2015, this regiment attempted a coup d'etat, which unfortunately, which fortunately did not succeed. So following uh, this defeat, this the government asked the United Nations for help in order to carry out um, na national security reform. So two years later, the triggering factor was the security situation at the national level, which translated into millions of displaced persons who are uh, on the roads, uh, a lot of terrorist activity. Several regions within the country are essentially controlled by terrorist groups. And then there's the trust in the government that has been tremendously reduced. The population doesn't really trust the government. So there was, so people wanted democratic reforms and then there was this rise of terrorism at the same time. And this really presented some serious security challenges that we had to face. So this really put into question uh, our sorry. national security. And so in 2017, the government organized a national security forum so that the people of Burkina Faso could tell us what were its expectations towards security. And this forum demanded the drafting of a national security policy. And this began in 2018, 2019. In 2018, we had to think about the process. Uh, how would we do this? And we thought about setting up a large national commission um, headed up by uh, the National Security Committee and the president and a director, a directorate that had three ministries included in it. And then we set up a scientific committee, which included researchers, uh, experts, security experts. And they were really the ones who were to set this process in motion. The drafting committee was um, had representatives from all the ministries, representatives from civil society, politicians from 
the ruling party and also from the opposition. Uh, trade unions were represented, women, young people, the entire society was represented. So we had an advisory group also that was composed of uh, former leaders. We had 12 former leaders uh, that were part of this um, advisory committee. Now, the scientific committee in the process had a very important job. They recommended a documentary review, and that meant reading through all the documents that we had. And with a focus on documents on the security of the Sahel. And so we came to the conclusion that worldwide jihad was an important aspect and that this was a very important factor to consider. So we presented all of this to the government and we said that this national security policy we were going to implement was a policy that needed to take into account human security. And this is something that had all been, so been said during the National Forum on Security. So we proposed that instead of creating a national security and defense policy, we had to shift the paradigm to just have to have a national security policy that would take into account all areas of the nation's life, be it education, the economy, human security. And the government Im nearly immediately accepted this. Uh, there was no debate on this. So we moved forward in this direction. Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Colonel Major uh, Pele. Uh, thank you. In the, same, in the same way with Nigeria, um, is the document public? Uh, but before that one, what is the process of approving and adopting the government and the uh, whether the parliament is to be engaged in the process of the uh, of the adoption and approval and whether what was the plan for the communication and dissemination of the document um uh, uh, please you are welcome uh, uh, colonel major uh, pilot yes the document from the start, uh, we designed it as a, declator, a, a declaration to the public. It had to be public, um, public to the Burkinabis who would be in charge of implementing it, but it should also be available to our neighbors so that they could understand our objectives and our vision of national security. So uh, the document is not yet on the internet because it has not yet been formally adopted. Since February, 2020, we have begun a dissemination process uh, through the media. We have held several seminars inviting the press to come in and understand uh, the document and the shift in, in the paradigm. All institutions uh, that are in charge of training security forces are starting to introduce the process. And of course, uh, we are training people at, at the national administration uh, schooling level. Within uh, with the citizens, we're holding public conferences within the regions. Uh, we did this during the drafting of the document. And now we're having them in the provinces because Burkina Faso has several provinces. So we're going to the provinces to try to really disseminate this document so that the entire population can understand the new direction the system is moving in. Oh, thank you very much, uh, General Pelle. Um, is there intention of engaging the parliament in the uh, during the process of approval and adoption?
Alors, pour le processus euh, euh, de, de validation nationale. In terms of the national validation process, which is underway. And we hope to um, really get to that phase in May. We, we really, right now, we're dotting our I's, doing the final uh, work, and we want to present it to the parliament in April, perhaps, and then have a session in May for the document to be adopted. But we have to note that the parliament was involved from the very beginning. In the scientific committee, we had a member of parliament. Um, there were also members of parliament that were involved in other portions of the process, and they monitored the process from beginning to end. There was also a general presentation that was made to the parliament so that parliamentarians could understand what was going on and what our work was. So for approval, we have scheduled a meeting with the technical committee for the validation of the text. It may take place next week. They have to validate all laws that are proposed. So we need this committee to understand the new concepts that are involved in this national security policy. Um, because if they don't understand it, obviously we're going to have problems getting it approved. And then there's going to be a governmental seminar so that ministers, the ministers who are going to support um, this document before parliament, fully understand every concept and, and the vision of this policy. Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Pele. Uh, maybe the last question, like what we we asked also the um, the Ambassador Lesende, is what are some of the challenges, core challenges that encounter you during the uh, the development of the national security strategy for Burkina Faso, and how did you manage to overcome some of these challenges? The first challenge we encountered was this shift in paradigm, how to make it understood to all the strata that were involved. And that means security and defense forces, which are used to be the leaders in terms of security. Uh, the armed forces, you know that Burkina Faso is a country that has undergone military rule for many years uh, until 2014. The, the current regime is the only civilian, the first civilian regime we've had. So this is a, a big challenge to change people's mentality, people's point of view, so that they understand this new vision. The second challenge, it was in terms of the planning of the national economy. So the new regime came to power in 2016. They came up with a development program for the economy and the social aspects. And so this involved the entire country. So as soon as we undertook this work, there, there a, a conflict arose between this vision and security. So we still, it was not an easy situation and we still have some issues related to that. The national planning authorities, you know, you had to change laws. Uh, so there were new laws introduced in 2018, 2019. You, you have to modify uh, some elements of, of the constitution, of, of the basic laws, and that was the, the biggest, the first challenge. We were lucky enough to have the political will present. The head of state supported us, and they met these challenges, and they supported us. Now, the other challenge uh, is one that everyone has encountered. 
the material support challenge to develop a national security policy, it is very important that you have um, national resources, that it be done in a sovereign manner so that you need to have um, the national budget must integrate funds for this process. It wasn't completely possible. We only got half the funds we wanted. So we had to rely on technical partners who had interests that were not necessarily those of the Burkina Bees people. But we did our best to preserve the interests of our nation. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Pele, uh, for such an um, elaborate and, and for the participant. Uh, the case study of uh, is, is, is there. It's one of our main um, 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 reading material. Please, you can be able to, to access it. Uh, let me now move to Dr. Feli. Um, maybe briefly, Feli, uh, can you just highlight some of the key elements of phase five? And that's the adoption and approval, and then phase six, dissemination and the communication. And I especially reference to the, these two case studies and what we, and what is actually providing the toolkit as well. Uh, uh, Dr. Fairley, you're most welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be joining you. Just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me um, all right. Oh, that's really comforting. <laughs> Good. So yeah, so um, we're coming now to the exciting end of the of this process and the adoption and the approval phase. The adoption really depends on the initiation process. And without saying that it's ceremonial, it's something that differs quite a lot by each country. Um, and I think what we've heard here is that a well-prepared drafting process should have built into it lots of phases or lots of um, points in the process so that when it comes to adoption and approval there are really no surprises at that point and I think um, the Colonel Major um, has just given us a really good example how they did this in Burkina Faso how they prepared the terrain during the drafting process to show that um, at each point the terrain was prepared so there would be no surprises and so that it would meet with approval when it when it came to that point. Um, an interesting point here, though, is the involvement of Parliament, because uh, perhaps uh, the involvement of Parliament in approving what is often an executive document is not often thought of, but it's a really helpful way of adding to the democratic legitimacy of the whole process. Um, and, and so that's something that can be looked at in each case. Now, there may or may not be procedural uh, or legal basis for doing that. It might be that parliament can do, can get involved on its own initiative. It might be that the policy can be put to a vote. It might be that parliamentary committee members have been involved in the process further um, upstream in its development. There's different models, but thinking through in the process of how to involve parliament um, in the creation or at least in the adoption and the approval of the document really does enhance the legitimacy and credibility of it as a national strategy. And of course, so that's sort of phase, phase um, what we're calling phase five, with reference to the toolkit that you have in front of you. And that leads us to, to, to phase six, which is dissemination and communication. Because obviously, once you have this document, you have to share it. And uh, in this weekend, it's maybe helpful to think of it in uh, sort of two points. There's um, sort of horizontal dissemination and communication where you need to communicate the, the strategy across government stakeholders. Those um, parts of the security sector, all of the government institutions who need to act on the strategy need to be aware of it. And that may not necessarily be the case on its own. That may not happen automatically. That needs to be something that's thought of and anticipated and built into the process. Also um, at this stage, if it hasn't been done already, this is the time to work on that sensitizing sensitizing actors who are going to be involved in implementation sensitizing them to concepts to fundamental approaches we heard this in the case of Burkina Faso 
in our discussion group number four, it's been coming out a lot, the need for having a common language around concepts for implementation. And this dissemination phase is a point where that common language that may have been created at a higher level can begin to start filtering down to the actors that are gonna put it into, into, into place. And then, so that's sort of the intra-governmental part, but then there's another part of dissemination and communication, which is taking it to the public. Think of this as kind of the vertical part. So horizontal to the government, vertical to going to the public. And it should be a public document. We heard how in the case of Burkina Faso, this was, um, this was part of the concept from the very beginning. Um, sometimes this is a little controversial, but really there's no reason why the what of a national security strategy or policy shouldn't be public. In fact, it really helps because the national security strategy or policy is actually a tool for international relations as well as national security. It signals a defensive posture, a commitment to regional um, engagements, a peaceful stance, and that's helpful to share on a regional and international basis and also within a national public. So it really should be public and it's useful and helpful for its implementation if it is um, equally uh, the you know the, the at the same time the the how of of this there are some sensitive parts to that and then um, measures need to be taken to ensure that what is sensitive about how national security will be achieved is protected um, operational secrecy is protected in a way that's respectful of um, democratic governance and transparency and human rights but at the same time, um, the missions and the roles of security actors in, in fulfilling this policy should be shared and, and because they need to be held accountable for doing a good job of that during the review process and at a future time through the follow up and, and implementation. So those are some of the aspects around making it public. Now. In the making it public, there's the question of who are you reaching out to? On the one hand, you really need to think about engaging media at this point. Um, there's a tendency during the sort of national, just during the sort of development phase to keep this um, within a smaller circle of discussion, even through consultations and such, but engaging media in the dissemination is really a sort of force multiplier for uh, reaching the public uh, with, with what it is the government hopes to achieve in this. And it also helps lays the basis for democratic credibility, legitimacy, accountability of the security services themselves when it comes to putting a strategy into action. Um, and also for the government and, and uh, that since this is the strategy that they've led on developing. Um, now, the, the articulation here, and we've heard this in the cases of Nigeria as well, um, the articulation between dissemination and consultation, actually in many ways, the consultation that has the public consultation that's happened at the beginning of the dissemination process. So thinking about um, phase six, right back at the beginning at phase one, when you're planning this whole process is going to help you come up with a dissemination process that's more effective in terms of who it reaches out to, but possibly also more cost effective because you'll be able to, to build um, building contingencies there and, and avoid duplication and avoid um, extra costs that might not be necessary, which can sometimes hold these things up. And I think we saw a really good example of that, how in the Nigerian case, as the ambassador noted, where there was the stakeholders forum before the adoption of the um, of the policy and then also town hall meetings around the whole development process. And similarly in Liberia, if you wanna to refer to the case studies in the 2008 strategy development process, there was a consultation process that took the national strategy out to all 15 countries under the aegis of the Governance Ref um, Reform Commission. And those are both examples of how this can be done whereby consultation and dissemination can be uh, linked in a way that is helpful. So that's just a quick overview of phases five and six. Yeah, excellent. Um, uh, fairly, I think you really captured them very well and, and uh, in a good way. Uh, maybe the, uh, the, the last question about the challenges during these two phases, um, uh, phase five and phase six. And it is good you, you hinted the issue of, of parliament, the role of parliament to ensure the legitimacy and building the national consensus. Um, maybe just generally, what are the likely challenges that to be encountered during these two phases of approval and adoption and the communication and dissemination. It's good that you echo the issue of uh, media, which I think is very important. Some other challenges that you, you see are quite important to be aware 
and how to overcome some of these challenges, especially for these two phases. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, again, I think it's really true that a well-prepared drafting process, if you do phase one really well, <laughs> hopefully you won't have too many surprises, you won't have too many challenges by the time you come to this part. But um, nevertheless, there are always challenges. Now, when it comes to the approval part, there might be some procedural challenges. So it might be, for example, that there may be no legal or constitutional role foreseen for Parliament in the approval of a national security strategy document. Um, now that will depend on each specific context as to how that kind of challenge can be overcome in a way that is respectful of rule of law. But at the same time, um, that is also if that is is the case analysis of the nature of democratic control and democratic governance why is there no role for parliament foreseen um, in the approval of a national strategy for security when it's you know often um, when you're approaching this from a more comprehensive human security perspective um, and is that something that should should or could be addressed um, there's also certain logistical challenges to it. So, for example, um, even if it's possible to come up with a procedural way for a parliament to be involved in approving a national security strategy policy, a lot of parliaments are simply ill-equipped to do this. It might be that they have little experience in this. It might be that if this is a new process, there's perhaps not a very strong culture of parliamentary oversight or control of security sectors. It might be that um, there's just not a lot of capacity capacity for supporting the kind of approval process in a way that makes it really meaningful. So again, that's something that kind of analysis is something that can feed into the national security needs assessment, for example. Um, but it's also something that can be anticipated. And, and it's also a part where perhaps external um, support can be sought to help meet some of those um, challenges in the short term. And then um, and another sort of logistical aspect is that quite simply the dissemination phase um, implies costs and that needs to be budgeted. So um, consultation, that implies meetings, you know, we heard in Nigeria town halls, media outreach, you know, these are things that even if the relative cost of, of hosting such events is small, they have to be foreseen in advance, otherwise they risk not happening. And this dissemination part is too important to be left to the last minute and then to have um, stalled or, or held up because a budget couldn't be found to host a meeting or rent a room. Um, so those types of logistical challenges need to be thought of as well in advance. But um, for all the procedural and logistical challenges, to be honest, I think that mostly the biggest challenges are conceptual, cultural, or what the Colonel Major called a paradigm shifts, achieving this paradigm shift to a different way of thinking about national security. In a lot of places, the very legitimacy of parliament to be involved at that level of detail in national security strategy making might be challenged among those who have traditionally been responsible for this area of policy making. Cultures of secrecy um, might, for example, uh, work work against the idea of public dissemination and public share civilian representatives and democratic representatives involved in the creation of policies and strategies that this shouldn't be talked about or somehow it's taboo and this kind of um, all goes back to the idea of security as a sort of reserved domain that is you know the exclusive remit of um, professionals or experts who wear uniforms and 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 really not anybody else and and achieving then this paradigm shift that goes back to um, this again this idea of dialogue around shared concepts and establishing a common language and a shift towards more comprehensive human security than has been seen before in a lot of places. So I think at this stage we're beginning to see how what looks like national security you know, security strategy development is actually quite certain parts of the process. Dr. Luca? Um. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Felix. Excellent. And uh, I, um, I think you all agree with me. I think the, uh, the three panelists, they have done a great job and excellent job. And, and we are so uh, um, grateful and, and, um, and to thank you for providing us some practical uh, experience of how to develop, I mean, for the approval and adaptation and then the dissemination and communication of the year. So thank you very much, Ambassador Lucende. Uh, thank you, Colonel Major Pelle, and, and, and thank you also, Dr. Pelle. So we now move, because this is the concluding 
for the uh, round two. And uh, just some of the few things that we would like to share with you before I give uh, a chance to our director for some few words. Uh, first, let me say the following uh, for, the, uh, for the, uh, this session. This session will end now the round two of our, our national security strategy development process. But during the three sessions of round two, I think we discuss a practical way of uh, uh, way for the uh, for the six phases of the national security strategy development process, and the the practical application of these six phases uh, is illustrated in the uh, the toolkit that is available with you, and by the the the, the really uh, excellent case studies of Senegal, Gambia, South Sudan, Niger. Uh, uh, Nigeria and Burkina Faso. And you have heard the two excellent presentations of the year. But the, the success, what is coming out very clearly out of these, these uh, uh, phases, the success of these six phases rests on the political leadership and a new mindset for the way security is perceived uh, plan, manage, deliver, and overseen. And this is articulated very well, the issue of paradigm shift in the way security. But I think other thing is the issue of inclusivity. And then the last one, effective communication. These are quite ingredient, a very important critical uh, factors that can uh, ensure these phases are successful. Now we finish round two, and now we are going to round three. This round will focus the last phase of the national security strategy development. That is the phase on the implementation, the implementation in terms of process and mechanism and how to make a document, a living document that is adaptable, uh, adaptive and iterative in an iterative way. As I mentioned in one of the uh, previous session, there is abundance of well articulated public policy in Africa, but such policies are often not implemented and subsequently fail to solve the identified problem. This last round uh, of, of, uh, of the implementation, we'll have three sessions focusing on the implementation mechanism and sectoral security uh, policies, allocation of resources and leveraging partnership and civilian oversight, monitoring and periodic review. So these are quite a very important phase uh, for, the, uh, for the round, the, the last round. And this round, round uh, three will be open to all of you who attended round one and round two. Uh, my colleague uh, uh, Claude will send you an email message to invite all of you to join round three. We encourage each one of you to join round three uh, to finish the entire cycle of the national security development process. Thanks again for attending round two and we look forward to virtually meet again during round, round three. Uh, let me now invite our director uh, under her leadership, we have been having this program, uh, Kate Knopf, uh, for the final words. Uh, 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 so you are welcome, uh, uh, Kate. Well, thank you, Dr. Luca, and thank you to Ambassador Lissende, uh, to uh, Colonel Major Pale, uh, and to Dr. Shapui, uh, as always, uh, for such an insightful uh, conversation and sharing especially the experiences of Nigeria and Burkina Faso. We're really deeply grateful uh, for your contributions this morning. And I just wanna say in closing to all of our participants and, and uh, colleagues uh, for round two, uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you for the final discussion group session uh, tomorrow uh, for this round. Uh, and then uh, we hope that you'll rejoin us again, uh, as Dr. Luca said, in a few weeks time for round three. Uh, we also hope that you'll keep us updated uh, uh, on uh, your uh, careers and your advancements uh, and uh, your work in this national security strategy uh, field. Uh, please uh, be in touch with Claude or his colleagues in the Community Affairs uh, team. Uh, you can find on the website uh, for your country, uh, the specialist uh, who has uh, uh, your country, uh, and they will be sharing with you soon uh, about other Africa Center alumni uh, members and uh, community chapters in many of your countries uh, across the continent. And, and we hope that you'll stay engaged uh, uh, both within your country and uh, with us back in Washington, DC. You know, we look forward to the day when we can actually be together again. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, uh, it's great to have everyone on these virtual uh, uh, programs with us. So thank you once again for that. Uh, Dr. Luca, back to you uh, and uh, on to discussion groups tomorrow.
Thank you. So thank you again. And um, this is the closing of our uh, round two. And then we look forward for the, uh, for the discussion group. And uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the link will be sent to you immediately. So thank you very much for your attendance. And thank you very much for your participation and the good questions and the interaction. And thank you, uh, Ambassador um, Lucinde, uh, General Kipale, and then Victor Pirelli. Thank you very much, and we meet tomorrow. Congratulations. Bye.